Jesus is Lord. My hello, brothers and sisters. As we start our red letter study, uh, I think it would be good for us to just dip our toes for now. Simple meditation, a bit of scripture, not on the words of Christ as much as on the person of Christ right now. The incarnation, if you will, the word made flesh. Where we make a lot of mistakes, I think. And when I say we, I include myself. It is a mystery so great and so fast. It's easy to get lost in our own little brains thinking that we understand. Especially when we talk about his humanity. Now, one of the greatest mistakes is more of a heresy, actually. It's destructive. It's called the kenosis heresy. It's where uh, the kenosis, meaning emptying, is a focus on how much Jesus emptied himself and was truly and almost only a man. Oh, yeah, he, he was divine, but he was, he was a man, like us. And people who preach that like to focus on, just like him, we could also do exactly the same miracles. Just like he commanded things, we could command things, because he was a man when he did it, and we are men as well. It's connected to the whole little gods th uh, theology as well. And it's destructive, and it's based on a twisting of scripture. In Philippians, Chapter 2, where Paul talks about this specific subject. They, they forget one thing, actually, too. The first being, Paul is talking poetically. When you look at how Paul writes, he writes usually theologically. It's arguments built on arguments with a lot of verses. But not here. Actually, he, he, you see, though, he's expressing himself, he's using poetic language. So having even said, it's probably connected to a hymn, a song that existed back then in the, first, in the church. But... That's not even good there. They forget the other part, and that's looking at the passage itself. Um, this is what he actually says. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. They add one little phrase right after this, but emptied himself of his divinity. But there's, there's no place here that says that. It does not say that. I have argued a long time with a certain brother that kept saying, it says emptied itself of divinity. And I said, read it again. Where do you see that part? It doesn't say that. Nowhere does it say that in that text. Read it for yourself. Philippians chapter 2. Nowhere does Paul says he emptied himself of his divinity, of his attributes. It isn't. We're speculating. We're adding to scripture. Let's not do that. What we can read is by. And that's important. The Greek word really is the idea of here's how he emptied himself. Okay, how? By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. In other words, by putting on humanity. That's when we go, wait, that doesn't work. You cannot empty yourself by adding something. That's bad mathematic. When you, you want to remove something, you don't add, you remove it. Well, it's because this is divine mathematics. See, God is infinite, absolutely, gloriously infinite. But when you put on humanity to that, it limits humanity. In a sense, it kind of empties it without really removing it. We get hints of this when we look at, let's say, the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus um, show, removes some of that, that humanity for a minute and, and reflects his glory to the people there the three men who were with him. His glory shines because he kind of removed the veil for a minute, removed from that humanity and let the divinity show through. Not that he was going to get it back, he was showing it. And in the prayer of John 17, he says, I want to get that glory back. Not that he lost it, but I want that humanity to be gone and then my full divinity will be shown again. Think about it. The God who is everywhere present at all times, when you put out humanity, he can only be at one place at one time. He is still fully God, but because of humanity, he is, in a sense, limited. So this emptying happens because of adding limited humanity. So that's enough on that. If you want to read more on it, please do. It is an important doctrine because he was fully man, but also fully God. And we still have, I think, problem when we come to this great immense reality that is beyond us 
Either we put so much emphasis on his divinity, as some have fed, said, done through history to the point where you must take away the fact that he was truly and fully a man. You need to sleep and eat and stuff. But then we can put so much emphasis on the humanity part that we make him exactly like us. But he wasn't. Yes, I know. Please, listen to it all the way through before you shut off this video. Um, yes! He was truly man to the point that he was our great mediator, our great high priest. And like Hebrew tells us, we can come to him. He understands it having been truly a human being. But here's the thing. He was also truly God, which I'm not. He experienced his humanity as God. I don't. Plus, his humanity was without a sin nature. Mine has a sin nature. He had a, a similar humanity than Adam had. And he did not lose it like Adam did through sin. He didn't infect it, I should say, like Adam did with sin. So there's something different about how he experiences humanity than we did while still being fully human. And that, that's, again, don't fully grasp it, but it is important. It is important, like, for instance, when we come to uh, that moment of the temptation, Matthew and Luke, where he faces off the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And then at the end, the devil hits him with three last super temptations, super tests. And we have a tendency to focus that and say, Jesus is teaching us as humans how to deal with the devil. No, he's not. Not first and foremost. There's a lot we can glean from it. Amen. The importance of, of responding with scripture, but that's not the point of it. It's not here's how humans can face the devil. Because he was coming as God, putting on humanity and doing what we can't. What Adam couldn't. Adam faced the devil in the garden, lushness, blessings. Jesus did it in the wilderness, suffering, hunger. And he conquered. By putting on humanity, he conquered the devil, sin, and death. What we can't do. So there's something other about his humanity. Again, without removing the fact that it was truly humanity in which uh, we can then come close and say, you, you understand me. But to the point of saying, let's be careful to um, think we can describe it, understand it, or try to bring it into our corner. And that's the problem. We try, when we talk about the incarnation and try to make it more about us, well, we shouldn't. It, it is about how God came to save us through the incarnation, how God put on humanity and did what we couldn't do. And never could do. It's all about God. About God coming to us and being reconciled to us through Christ, not us trying to find a way to Him. And that, brothers and sisters, is excessively important. It's all about Jesus. And how, yes, as, as man, we can approach Him because He was a man, but He was also something other and greater. And that's what makes His, his high priestness, His work as a high priest and mediator, so much better than any other high priest that ever did. Again, that's what Hebrews is all about as well. So I hope this has been a blessing and I hope it didn't create uh, frustration in you and decide, uh, a desire to uh, respond back, you're wrong, you're a heretic, but instead thinking through just how great this incarnation truly was. Because when we start entering the teachings of Jesus, we have to see it as this, this wisdom living infinite wisdom incarnate in humanity communicating God communicating to us and that should leave us again in awe just like the incarnation does so on that brothers and sisters um, be blessed he's gonna burn it away the holy furnace will blaze eternal the day somebody come on